Hello, I'm Robert Riley, uh, the director of the Westminster Institute, and I want to welcome you to our online lecture series during this peculiar time. We are particularly delighted to welcome back Dr. Walid Faris, who is a good friend of the Westminster Institute and who has done some splendid lectures for us in the past. He's most gracious to return today uh, to give us a comprehensive look at the very puzzling uh, behavior of so many actors in Libya and to expl explicate that situation for us and bring us some clarity. Now, Dr. Walid Fares uh, was born in Beirut, Lebanon, where he spent the first half of his life until immigrating to the United States in 1990. He received two bachelor's degree, degrees from St. Joseph University in Beirut, uh, and obtained a master's of laws degree from the Université de Lyon in France. In 1993, he obtained his PhD in international studies, international relations, and Middle East studies from the University of Miami. Uh, Walid has been very engaged in public affairs. He's been the foreign policy advisor to two presidential candidates. But in this brief introduction, I'll focus on his academic qualifications and his extensive writing. Uh, he has published 12 books in three languages, English, French, and Arabic. Uh, his post 9-11 books include Future Jihad, Terrorist Strategies Against the West. This is a very important book, The War of Ideas, Jihadism Against Democracy. Then The Confrontation, Winning the War Against Future Jihad, and the coming revolution, struggle for freedom in the Middle East. The uh, most recent publication is The Lost Spring, U.S. Foreign Policy and the cat Catastrophe to Avoid. We're delighted to welcome Waleed back for his presentation on Libya. Thank you, dear Bob. I would like to thank you, Dr. Riley, and thank the Westminster Institute. Amazing job in educating and informing the American public. This is basically the most important exercise that we who are involved in academia and research, advise policymakers, opinion makers can offer to the American public and to American democracy. Our public needs to be informed about these conflicts and these issues worldwide to be able to make the right choices here at home in the selection of our lawmakers and leaders. The topic of Libya is really in the heart of the field I am in for the last 30 years. I've taught, published, been interviewed, interacted with politicians, leaders, NGOs across the Middle East, including in Libya. But Libya in particular, I've been following since I was a teenager, back in the old days in Beirut, I was uh, looking at the events, both in Lebanon and then there was a war in Lebanon, and the developments in the Middle East around my mother country. And for about 40 years, I have been following the developments in Libya, 80% of it was basically what one single man, dictator Gaddafi, has been doing from 1969, the end of 1969, when he took over the reign of government in a coup d'etat, all the way to his demise in 2011, and then the very tense and dangerous years since the revolt in Libya in what was called then the Arab Spring, which we in America got involved in as well as our partners in France and Europe, then other players in the region. And now Libya is in the midst of a very violent confrontation between at least two camps. And those camps are 
backed by regional actors. So that's in a nutshell, my own interests. I have briefed, testified, been interviewed, met with members of parliament of Libya, human rights uh, activists and others. So based on that experience that I've had for 40 years, 10 of these years in the Middle East, and the other 30 here in the United States. One of the challenges that the US policy has since the so-called Arab Spring, and I would say even since the end of the Cold War, but more specifically since the upheavals in Egypt, Syria, Yemen, uh, other places, and of course Libya, was to make sure that the choice we are making as Americans is the right choice, is not gonna cost us later in terrorism, economic problems. In Libya, the challenges are even higher because of who is there and who is involved. So let's do this uh, historic journey first to see how the war started, and then we'll move to what is the current situation, and then we could do a discussion, summary discussion about what would be the best options that the United States now and after the elections would or should have with regard to Libya. Libya is a very large country in the Middle East, as we can see in map one, and most of it is desert. It is inhabited by a majority of Arab population, but also has minorities, including Berber, Amazigh, and in the South, Africans. It was the battlefield in World War II that we are all familiar with. Then few years of independent regime under King Senussi. And in 1969, Muammar Gaddafi, an officer, a young officer in the Libyan uh, army then, conducted a coup d'etat, some say backed by Egypt and Abdel Nasser at the time. Now, who is Muammar Gaddafi ideologically and politically. Very important to understand. It's gonna allow us to understand uh, against whom that revolution took place in 2011. Muammar Gaddafi is part of what was known in the Middle East as the Arab nationalist movement. The Arab nationalist is a pan-Arabist movement. They want to establish a one Arab Ummah nation from Morocco to Iraq including all these countries. It's a kind of a return of a secular caliphate. Uh, it is modeled after the German reunification project, the Italian reunification project, but it has multiple political parties operating. In the East, in Syria and Iraq, the most no notable Arab nationalists were the Ba'ath regime of the Assad family and of Saddam Hussein. In Egypt, you had Abdel Nasser, the great leader of the 50s and the 60s, the one who was uh, clashing with Israel in two or three wars, that is Egypt and Israel. And in Libya, Muammar Gaddafi represented that trend, which was very radical. But in addition to that, he promoted himself as a socialist leader, third world type of socialism. In addition to that, he had a third component. He brought in what he called the Islamic Green Revolution, not to compare with the green movements today. So he created this ideology that has one dimension that is Arab nationalist, another dimension that is socialist, and a third dimension that is really a Gaddafi dimension, Islamic Green Movement, which is different from the Islamist, the Salafi, the Muslim Brotherhood. Gaddafi were not very, was not very clear on what he was talking about. That's why very few in the Arab world followed him, but he meddled himself in many, if not all the crises in the Arab world. He had a huge income in oil. Libya has the largest reserves, among the largest reserves in the world, from the largest before, before Nigeria became in Africa as well. We, because of that cash that he obtained, he created a very large, army in equipment, not really in, in soldiers, but he funded many terrorist organizations across the Middle East. He supported the PLO, but he criticized them. 
he supported other organizations. Uh, he found himself in the 70s and 80s backing radical groups that operated in Europe and elsewhere. But also, he was an ally to the Soviet Union. So, Gaddafi was a unique, unusual leader. Uh, Sadat used to call him the, uh, the boy, the adolescent, the teenager, because of his style and speeches. The bottom line is that Gaddafi ruled from 1969 till 2011. He survived many changes in the world and in the Middle East, including the collapse of the Soviet Union. So those changes are going to take us to 2011 and the revolution. The first most important change that occurred with regard to Gaddafi's policies in the region from being a very radical pro-terrorist leader was a massive retaliation by the Reagan administration, 1986, in order to punish the Gaddafi regime for being involved in a terror action against an American airliner, the famous Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie in Scotland, with hundreds of people killed. The United States waged a air raid over Libya, killing many people in the surrounding of Gaddafi. And since that, moment, Gaddafi disengaged from a confrontation, from a direct confrontation with the United States and the West. He understood. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was reforming under Gorbachev, so Gaddafi understood that he is not going to have the backing of the Soviet Union, which is busy in Glasnost and Perestroika. The second shock came to Gaddafi was in 2003. When the Bush administration moved into Iraq, removed Saddam Hussein, changed that regime by force, and then captured Saddam Hussein, gave him to the Iraqi interim government at the time, which were militias, and he was tried and executed. This shocked Gaddafi. And in a meeting of the Arab League after that, in 04, he said, where are the Arabs? One of our leaders was captured and executed. It is going to happen to each one of us, what he said. Indeed, it happened to him years later. What happened after the fall of Saddam was that Gaddafi announced that he is, he is going to let go of his weapons of mass destruction system because he had them. And he asked the international community to come and dismantle his, weapon of ma his weapons of mass destruction, his long-range missiles, the biochemical capabilities. And from then on, not only he let go of that system of weapons, he started to cooperate, probably in a very confidential way, with US and European agencies to go after the terrorists, including Al-Qaeda. So now we are in 04. And Gaddafi has shifted against the jihadists, against the Salafists and the Islamists. That created an enmity between the Gaddafi regime and all the Islamists' organizations and movements that would range from the Muslim Brotherhood all the way to Al-Qaeda and the other affiliated organizations. In 2011, the so-called Arab Spring begins. And it hit many Arab countries. In Egypt, there was an uprising against uh, the Egyptian government at the time, Mubarak regime. In Syria, against the Assad regime. In Yemen, against the government of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And in Libya, there was a series of demonstrations against Gaddafi for the first time since he came to power. And his reaction was very violent from the beginning. Unlike Assad or Ben Ali of Tunisia or the leader of Yemen or uh, his neighbor in, 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 uh, in Egypt, he immediately resorted to massive power, including air force, tanks. There were massacres, including in Benghazi. That prompted all of his enemies, all of his foes, to come together and rise very quickly against him. Now, who were the foes of Gaddafi in 2011? He had all the liberals that he had suppressed, put in jail, tortured, 
Some of them were in Europe, others in hiding, other elements in the Arab world. They rose against him. But the liberals basically were mostly visible in newspapers or on TV. The second component were officers within the Libyan armed forces, including his chief of staff at the time. They knew that Gaddafi was lost and they wanted to uh, guide Libya slowly from where it was into engaging the international community, meaning they wanted to have a military controlled interim government like in Egypt and then give it to civilians. The third component, the most important component, were the Islamists. And when we say the Islamists, it's a collection between the far jihadists, Al Qaeda, and all the satellite organizations, the Salafi jihadi fighting groups on the one hand, to the more political network of groups under the Ikhwan or the Muslim Brotherhood. So these three components were competing to replace Gaddafi. What was US policy at the time? Well, the Obama administration between 2009 and actually 2016 had adopted a different policy than the Bush administration and even all the previous American administrations. What was that policy? With regard to the Middle East, there were two directions that the Obama administration had adopted. One was the Iran deal. And because of the Iran deal, there was a dialogue or a discussion between the Obama administration and the Iran regime to get to the Iran nuclear deal, which meant that the United States will disengage from its strong posture against that regime. With of course, consequences in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and elsewhere. The other arm was to engage with and to partner with the Muslim Brotherhood. Many ask the question, why would the Obama administration engage with the Muslim Brotherhood? Because the Muslim Brotherhood's influence in America for the previous 40 years has impacted think tanks, uh, universities, media, and then little by little into the bureaucracies and made the case that the Muslim Brotherhood are a better alternative than Al Qaeda or the violent jihadists, at least since the 90s. So when President Obama went in 2009 to Cairo and delivered his speech, uh, most of the prominent VIPs who were in the audience were either close to or part of the Muslim Brotherhood. In Libya, Gaddafi was basically seen by the international community, by the US and Europe, as a lost case. So they were looking for an alternative. And uh, the intelligentsia in Washington at the time, under the Obama administration, thought that partnering with the Muslim Brotherhood and with the allies of the Muslim Brotherhood would be the best alternative, both in Egypt and in Libya, but also possibly in Tunisia in other countries. So among the three oppositions to Gaddafi, those linked to the Brotherhood were in the best position because they were assured almost that when Gaddafi will fall, they will be either directly or indirectly under that name or a different name, the transition. So now in those critical months between 2000 11, between March of 2011 and then the end of the year, those months were critical to see the race between the three components. The liberals were in the media making the case that Gaddafi's regime is bad, so he was lost. The military, including high-ranking officers who became dissidents from the uh, uh, Gaddafi regime, tried to control the ground for the benefit of the army then. And then, of course, the Islamists benefited from the actual NATO action against Gaddafi to weaken him and then bring him down. And of course, they were the militias, jihadi militias, who actually killed him, killed Gaddafi. So in the weeks after Gaddafi was eliminated, there was a, oh, and months, of course, there was a quick race between the Islamists and the branch of the army that rose against. Gaddafi. 
there was an incident in the east of the country where the chief of staff, of the former chief of staff of the army, was assassinated. Uh, it was said, alleged, that by Islamist militias, by jihadi militias. So as of 2012, basically, after Gaddafi, the country had many political parties and factions and tribes, but the strongest central force were the Brotherhood, or the Brotherhood linked. And obviously they profited from the fact that both Europe and the Obama administration kind of partnered with them, shepherded them, or let them do whatever they wanted. That's in terms of substance. In terms of form, there were several attempts by the UN and the international community to organize the transition of power in Libya between 2012 and 2015. Meanwhile, there was an election in 2014. It's a crucial stage in the evolution of Libya, 2014. Elections were organized, sponsored by the United Nations, monitored by NGOs, and the result was surprising to many. Though the Islamists, militias, and the Brotherhood were the most active, were in control of the bureaucracies at the time because they controlled the various ministries, the result was that civil society in Libya brought to the parliament a majority of non-Islamists, a majority of anti-jihadists, a combo of liberals, tribes, social democrats, and of course, a significant component of Islamists. But the majority was not. And that parliament opposed the control by these militias of the capital, Tripoli, and of course, of Benghazi. As a result of that, in 2014, the parliament was ejected out of Tripoli. The Libyan, the last elected body was ejected out of Tripoli and went into exile to the far east of Libya, to the famous city of Tobruk. So as of the end of 2014 into 15, Libya has in Tripoli, a bureaucracy controlled by the Islamist militias, plus their allies, and in Far East um, Tobruk, you had a parliament that is elected by the people of Libya and is anti-Islamist. Also in 2014, another phenomenon occurred, and now it's gonna get us closer to the events that Libya is living today. Out of the desert in the eastern side of Libya, a number of officers and soldiers, which were part originally of the Libyan army, then followed the line of the dissidents against Gaddafi, but were very concerned about the rise of various jihadist and Islamist militias, formed what they call the Libya National Army. The Libya National Army is, in fact, a branch or a piece or brigades of the original Libyan army, but with volunteers right and left coming to join that force. What was the goal of that force? That force aimed at going, first of all, against Al-Qaeda factions, in Libya, which were mostly found in Derna, to the east, were found in the center of the country, on the coast mostly. And as of the end of 2014 and 15, who would come to Libya? ISIS. ISIS, which started basically in Iraq and Syria, had cells operating in a variety of Arab countries. But in Libya, they found a great location to reestablish or establish an emirate. So the LNA started a warfare coming from the east. It took, it seized, or they call it, it liberated Benghazi from these militias. And then slowly and surely, 2015 and 16, it marched across the country, mostly in the east and in the south. Comes another very important chapter, which is in 2015. In 2015, the United Nations intervened again. 
in a collection of governments from the international community, from Europe, and the Obama administration pushed the Libyan factions to a meeting in Morocco, in the city or the town of Sherat. This is a name that is now being used as the origin, the legal constitutional origin of the current government of Libya. During that meeting, most of the factions of Libya came together. That would be the authority in charge in Tripoli, an interim authority. That would be the Libyan parliament, the LNA, and other components and political parties. All of these forces came together. They were recognized, and that's a crucial element in understanding today's situation. They were recognized by the United Nations as the founding fathers of the new Libya. So what was that summit or convention about? It was about to create a new government that would unify all these forces. It will be called the GNA. That's the interim government that would rule Libya. It would have a presidential council and then executive branches. It will be recognized by the Libyan parliament. So, you know, any government in any democracy, the executive branch would have to be recognized by the parliament, and it will have the LNA as one of the components of its army. That was the deal that was blessed and recognized by the United Nations. Because often today, we hear the term of the GNA, which rules in Tripoli, is the UN-recognized government. True, but the GNA is one of the various components recognized by the United Nations in Sherat in 2015. That means that also the parliament of Libya, the last elected parliament, the GNA was not elected, it was appointed. The parliament was elected, is also UN recognized. And the LNA, because it participated in this Sherat agreement, indirectly though, and recognized as such by the parliament, they're all UN recognized. The GNA came to Tripoli and there was an attempt as of 2015, 2016 to create that unity. The Obama administration was supportive of that process. What was the problem? The problem is that the parliament of Libya, made of a majority of moderates, or at least non-Islamist or jihadists, said, I will give approval to that government, the GNA, if they disband the militias. No country can rise and come back to democracy. We cannot do more elections, municipalities, and say, we cannot move forward if we have militias. And the militias in Tripoli were basically either connected to the jihadists in central Libya, or they were brotherhood. So now the GNA refused to disband the militias, did not get the approval of the parliament. What does that leave Libya with now. The, uh, the, the essential UN recognition to the Sherat Agreement and to the GNA government was based on the fact that that government would be recognized by the parliament. It was not. So a new status quo has emerged. And that status quo is a, is a de facto division in Libya. On the one hand in Tripoli, I'm talking about 2016, you had the GNA government under Mr. Siraj as the chief executive, uh, of a body of nine members. And then in Benghazi, you have now the Libyan parliament and the LNA, both of them equally legitimate, equally recognized by the international community from Cairo. Now, many may not agree on my, with my terminology, but that's how you read it from a legal perspective based on international law. The Obama administration left. The Trump administration came. So the question is, 
what is the policy? What was the policy of the U.S. since 2017 with regard to Libya? The U.S. administration, the new U.S. administration took some time before it develops a new policy. So it was basically the bureaucracy, the foreign policy bureaucracy of the previous administration that managed the Libya dossier until a couple of things started to change in Washington in terms of new policy. On the ground, something else has happened in 2017 and 2018. The forces of the LNA on the ground were able to seize a lot of territory. It took all the territory to the east, all the way to the Egyptian border, went to the south, as you can see now in map B, second map, or map two if you want, and it was able to control almost the entire coast that is rich in oil, all the oil ports for export, and it came closer and closer to the West. So all of that was achieved in 2017, 2018. But Libya remained divided in two portions, in two parts. The West was the GNA, and the East was the Parliament and the LNA. Now, international and regional intervention. Over the past three years, we've witnessed a rise in the level of intervention outside actors. The GNA was supported initially and then increasingly by two important players and by a movement. The two important regional players who do not hide that intervention are first Qatar which has been backing Tripoli and its institutions and funded a lot of the political activities worldwide in support of the GNA. And then came Turkey with the uh, President Erdogan government, which also, and very publicly so, said we are supporting the GNA. So now you have a regional bloc which is backing the GNA on the military level, political, diplomatic, and financial. On the other side, you have another pl other players. You have Egypt backing the LNA and the parliament under President Sisi's government. You have the UAE under the leadership of MBZ, Hamad bin Zayed. You have also other players, not always very visible, but from the Arab world, who started to back the LNA which is under the command of Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. So who is the commander of the Libya National Army? Known as General Khalifa Haftar, or as his rank in his own army says, Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar. General Haftar or Field Marshal Haftar was a high-ranking officer in the Qaddafi army initially in the 80s. Then he quit Libya before, because of disagreements with Gaddafi. And he was hosted in the United States where he lived for 20 years in Virginia as an exile in opposition to Gaddafi. As soon as the war started in Libya, he and other officers and soldiers of the Libya army or ex-military of the Libya army decided to go and help Libya get rid of the militias and of Al-Qaeda and of ISIS. And he was the one who actually launched what, was, what became the LNA, as we mentioned earlier. So General Haftar, or Field Marshal Haftar, became the commander of that force, expanding in the east. He was recognized in his army, obviously, by the parliament. So unlike what some are claiming, he did not impose himself though on the ground, obviously, his army did against the jihadists and the Islamist militias, but he obtained a recognition by the parliament, which basically was in Tobruk and moved to uh, Benghazi. So the LNA is not an ideological army. Obviously, it's anti-jihadist, anti-Islamist. Second, it is not aligned to international great powers like Gaddafi was with the Soviet Union. Thirdly, Haftar and the LNA 
wanted to establish, as far as they said, good relations with the international community. He's an ally to Egypt. Egypt is an ally to the United States. He's an ally to the UAE, and the UAE is an ally to the United States. Um, the LNA wanted to establish good relations with the United States, but it was not able to do so, obviously, under the Obama administration, which backed the other side, the Brotherhood side. However, the LNA was able to establish strategic relations with France, NATO member and our partner. So there is something complicated about the relationships here because Turkey is a NATO member so the U.S. has have good relations with Turkey, and therefore Turkey represents part of, of NATO. But on the other hand, France represents also NATO, which means that NATO on Libya uh, backs both sides. Turkey backs Tripoli, and France backs uh, Benghazi, which complicates issues. So back now to the U.S. position. The United States bureaucracy or foreign policy establishment chose to recognize Tripoli, what they call the UN recognized government, but did not want to have enmity with the LNA. So the general idea was to try to bring both of them to the table of negotiations with a little tilt, one must add, to Tripoli. Until 2019. In 2019, there was a surprise event or development which created another manifestation of US policy towards Libya. A phone call came from the White House to Benghazi and President Trump spoke with Field Marshal Haftar. Not only they spoke, but there was a statement that was issued stating that the US president and the commander of the Libya army that's the title that was given, discussed efforts against terrorism and President Trump praised Haftar for his efforts against terrorism. So now you have two policies, one coming from the foreign policy establishments and institutions that has a tilt towards Tripoli, but wants a political solution under the UN, and another policy coming straight from the White House, from the president that says, Haftar and the LNA and therefore the parliament should be our partners against terrorism, which was not easy to be understood in the Arab world or in the Middle East or even in the international community. So now let's bring it back home to paint a tableau, a picture of what has been happening over uh, 2019 and 2020. On the ground, the LNA forces were able to terminate ISIS and Al-Qaeda on the coasts around Sirt and make the control of the oil zone asserted. They uh, ended the jihadist enclave that was in Derna in the east, and then Haftar and the LNA gathered their forces and moved towards Tripoli. Meanwhile, obviously, Turkey and Qatar were backing Tripoli and Mr. Siraj. And for the first time over the past maybe six months, you have a direct intervention by Turkey in Libya. That was not the case before. Qatar and Turkey before used to send weapons and other support. UAE and Egypt, non officially, and other countries would support Haftar. So what changed the geographics or the geopolitics of it was that Turkey intervened directly by sending uh, military attaches and advisors, equipment, anti-aircraft, missiles, and mostly an army of drones or flying drones to push back against the LNA forces. A few months ago, Another development also changed the landscape on the ground, which is that President Erdogan's government signed an agreement with Mr. Siraj GNA government, the provisional government of Libya, whereby they did something that nobody expected, 
not only created a security agreement, but divided international waters, the economic zones between Libya and Turkey. They created, look at map three, they created a zone between Turkey and Libya to be partitioned between the two countries in terms of economic zone. That created a crisis in the Mediterranean that has nothing to do with the fight in Libya, but it will be intertwined with this fight. So we're talking 2020, the Libya conflict moved from local in Libya to become a Mediterranean crisis. Why? That water zone and high seas basically is rich in oil, petroleum, and uh, other uh, richness and, and wealth. But that is in international waters. It cut off Greece access to those energy deposits in the Mediterranean. It also put pressure on Cyprus' ability to uh, take advantage, and obviously on Egypt's ability. So as of spring of 2020, you have now Greece moving in, Greece tilting towards Field Marshal Haftar and the LNA, Cyprus moving in, both of them members of the European uh, Union, complaining about Turkey creating that new equation in the Mediterranean, Greece coordinating with Egypt, with Israel to a certain extent, and with Cyprus. So the landscape in the Mediterranean has changed and added to the conflict in Libya. So on the one hand, you have Turkey and Qatar backing Tripoli. And now you have Egypt and the UAE and Greece and Cyprus all coalescing with the east of Libya. So at this point in time, you have the two superpowers or US really the superpower, but another power, Russia, interested in the game. And here, let me say a couple words about Russia's role. From the onset of the LNA in 14, 15, and 16, questions were uh, you know, asked in, in Washington and in Brussels as well, what would be the relationship between Haftar, Marshal, Field Marshal Haftar, and Russia? Why? Because the officers of the old Gaddafi army had ties to the Soviet Union, but that's what happened with Egypt. Egypt had excellent relations with the Soviet Union until Sadat changed the policy, but their equipment was still Soviet and Russian for a long period of time. Both Egypt and the UAE, though they are direct allies of the United States, have relationship with Russia uh, for a variety of other uh, reasons. So the east of Libya doesn't have a preferential treatment between America and Russia. They meet with both officials but they do have relationship with Russia in the same way Cyprus has relationship with Russia as well. So that was level one. Level two, a Russian aircraft carrier came a couple of years ago to the coast of Libya and invited Haftar to visit the, uh, the aircraft carrier. He went in and of course his photo was taken and then his opponent camp accused him of preferring Russia and bringing the Russians to Libya. It did not actually happen. Had there been a U.S. aircraft coming to Benghazi inviting Haftar to go, he would have been very happy, I imagine, or a French carrier or an Indian carrier. He, he would have visited because Field Marshal Haftar and the LNA, they need international backing. You have the United States superpower is now interested in it. You have Russia as a great power uh, in the East uh, interested in, in Libya. And questions were asked in Washington and in Brussels from the onset of the LNA, 14, 15, 16, into 17, about the state of relationship between the LNA and Russia. Why? Because most of the officers in the LNA were officers in the Gaddafi army, and Gaddafi had great strategic relations with the Soviet Union, therefore with Russia. But that's the same case with Egypt, which was an ally of the Soviet Union. And then it let go of the Soviet Union, it turned to the United States under Sadat, and all of its equipment became American, and they were trained train missions between U.S. forces and Egyptians for 20 years, 25 years. 
Egypt and, and UAE are partners with the United States, yet they visit and meet and talk with uh, Russian leaders. So the LNA basically and Field Marshal Haftar are too small in size to basically become the ally of one or the other, but they want all the allies possible against the jihadists and the Islamist militias which explains why the LNA obtained an alliance with France, which is NATO, which is an ally of the United States. But the Russians were pushing. They wanted basically to show that Haftar and the LNA are in their zone of influence. There was an incident two years ago when, when an aircraft carrier, a Russian aircraft carrier, came close to the Libyan uh, coast and invited Haftar to visit, which he did. Had it been an, a, an American aircraft carrier, a French, a British, or an Indian aircraft carrier, Haftar would have visited. Why? Because the position of the LNA and the parliament in Libya is to obtain as much as possible international recognition. So that was that point, and that picture taken then was used by the opposition to Haftar as he is closer to the Russians. Then, of course, with time, when the LNA got closer and closer to Tripoli. Turkey sent more and more weapons, and these were weapons under NATO, and that started to put pressure on the LNA. Uh, observers started to see a Russian presence in the east, and that presence was identified as a mercenary, a private security company, the Wagner Company, which actually is Russian, but it's not the Russian government but in smaller numbers. Yet, this was a signal that made Washington very nervous because they saw Russia, uh, Russian elements in, in, in the East. There was no base for Russia like in Syria. There is no open strategic relationship, but there is a presence. And the LNA considered that that presence, that private presence, would be the equivalent of Blackwater if the Americans would have been hired or engaged in east of Libya, and actually there were Western elements in, in the eastern part of Libya. Now let's come to the current situation. Now you have the LNA pushing all the way to Tripoli, almost controlling the areas between Tripoli and the Tunisia border. So Tripoli was the last enclave along with Misrata, the other strong enclave by the GNA Islamist militias force. Then things started to change. Turkey sent significant amount of equipment, used its air drones and its assets on the ground to shell and push back against the LNA. And indeed, the LNA withdrew from around Tripoli and rapidly started to withdraw all the way to the center of Tripoli as this map shows you. So now you have west of Sirt, all the way to the Tunisian borders, you have the, LA, the GNA government under Mr. Siraj and the Islamist militias and the jihadi groups in charge. And from Sirt to the east, all the way to the Egyptian borders, you have the LNA and the parliament in charge. Another element of concern other than the Russians, but this time in the west of, uh, of Libya, were thousands of jihadists who were transferred from northern Syria by the Turkish authorities, almost openly. The documents and the videos are on YouTube, and uh, actually, there was an open decision by the Turkish government in Ankara to bring volunteers jihadi volunteers or Islamist volunteers who were in Idlib, in Syria, or in other parts of northern Syria, or even elements from within the refugee population inside Turkey. The Human Rights Council or Association of Syria issued a press release stating that close to 10,000 jihadists have been shipped and transferred to the West of Libya and are operating under the GNA and Turkey against the LNA. So now, in terms of involvement, you have in the East, the LNA plus few elements from the Russian private company. We don't know much about what 
is their status now after the withdrawal from the West. But in the West, you have, if we believe the Syrian human rights NGO, close to 10,000 jihadists. So when we talk about 10,000 jihadists, this is the quarter or the third of the entire ISIS caliphate that existed in Iraq and Syria. These are not hundreds of jihadists or a couple thousand of jihadists. These are 10,000. Now, as it is right now, Libya is divided in two parts. What are the impacts of the current situation on regional and Mediterranean and international security? So, with the presence of the Russians in eastern Libya, this matter has to be dealt with between the United States and Russia. And the U.S. position is that those private consultant or mercenaries should be withdrawn from Libya. And that would be a good thing because the less internationalization of Libya in terms of military involvement, the better it is. But that is not really even comparable with the other problem that now we got in Western Libya under the GNA, this huge army of jihadists who are linked to al-Nusra and linked to al-Qaeda and others and at least who are working with the Muslim Brotherhood. Why? Because from Western Libya, these jihadists can easily cross to many countries in the Sahel. That would be from Chad to Niger to Mauritania, and eventually hook up with Boko Haram in Nigeria. This is huge. This is not just Libya. We're talking about one fifth or fourth of Africa that could be penetrated by these thousands of jihadists, in addition to Tunisia, which already has some instability, Algeria, which witnessed a civil war in the 90s between the same jihadists and the same type of jihadists and their army, and of course, Egypt. So that is going to cause a big problem in Africa, but there is another wing to that problem. Jihadists who are deployed in Libya are at one water crossing from Europe. Europeans now are very nervous just to, un to think of the idea that thousands of jihadists are massed in Libya. And if they cross, including as refugees, into Italy, Spain, and France, um, everything we've seen over the past 20 years in terms of Al-Qaeda or ISIS activities in Europe will pale in comparison with that new wave. And the last problem, the Erdogan government had allowed or some would say helped hundreds of thousands of refugees who were present in Turkey, in South Turkey, mostly from Syria, to head towards the borders with Greece and Thras. And we've seen in the media that the Greeks have opposed that movement. They were backed by the European Union. Bulgaria has also blocked their borders because they know and they project that there would be radical elements within this mass population of refugees. Plus the argument that those refugees should go back to Syria. Why are they uprooted from Syria and sent to Europe? If Turkey controls Idlib, Turkey controls northern Syria, this is where they should go and the international community and the European Parliament should support them financially in Syria. But these refugees are helped and pushed towards those borders. Now we have a crisis on the Greek-Turkish land border. There is a concern in Europe that if those refugees cannot pass through the Turkish-Greek borders, they will be shipped to Libya they will be deployed or they will be put in camps in Libya. And if that happens, the concern would be that these refugees uh, would be then helped, quote unquote, to cross the Mediterranean Sea into Europe. And through them, the jihadists could infiltrate their ranks and then get to the European company. So now there is a major shift in European positioning with regard to Libya. They know that if the jihadists will stay, it's going to be a security threat. They know if the refugees are sent, and they may be sent without their consent, 
to Libya, there, will, there could be another humanitarian crisis across the Mediterranean that the Europeans have already lived a few years ago. U.S. position to close. The United States foreign policy has been, over the past three to three years and a half, under a lot of pressure. The Trump administration is dealing with the Iran challenge, which is huge. Defense of the peninsula, the presence in Iraq. We were in East Syria, the Kurdish issue. Uh, obviously, uh, the matter of the Iran deal. So that consumed a large segment of our Middle East policy. In addition to that, the fight against Daesh, ISIS, has consumed a lot of energies and resources. And it's not a secret in Washington that the domestic challenges that the administration went through and against have been huge. So because of all these fronts, both overseas and at home, little attention or little energy was given to the crisis in Libya. But one can summarize that the current position, which I believe is not going to change till the next elections, till the elections in the fall, is going to still uh, based on two considerations. The foreign policy bureaucracy would like to see a balance in Libya between the two forces and start some sort of talks and negotiations. Uh, the president is concerned and his advisors obviously are concerned about the terrorist factor and want to see who of the two forces on the ground is going to be more helpful to the United States in fighting against the uh, remnants of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the other Islamist uh, radical uh, militias. So with this, I would say that Libya is a very important place for U.S. policy to see stabilized, unified in the best way possible. Uh, the recommendations are that in any solution, there should be a participation of all factions and communities in the process. There should be elections when the militias are disarmed, which means that the key, the most important key for any process in Libya in the next few months would be who and when and how these militias will be disbanded and disarmed. If they want to be political parties, that's fine. How can they integrate the army and how the country should not go into under any dictatorship but becomes a representative democracy and a republic. And let's see how that would happen. Good. Waleed, thank you very much for that fascinating lecture exposing the mind-numbing complexity of the situation in Libya. May I ask you a question about Turkey? Is Turkey's involvement from neo-Ottoman pretensions or uh, Muslim Brotherhood allegiances? Um, what, what is its ultimate objective there? And does Erdogan see any danger of being at loggerheads with uh, Russia and Libya as indeed they were in Syria? First of all, there are two levels in Turkey's involvement in Libya. The level that we actually see is the level of the narrative. And yes, the fact that the Erdogan government, which is the AKP Islamist party in control of Turkey, follows the line of the Muslim Brotherhood thinking without being necessarily part of the Brotherhood. And therefore, we'll get involved in northern Syria, in Libya, in Iraq, in Yemen, southern Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, in all the places where the Brotherhood have some influence and have a case. That is not a secret. But below the level of ideology and policies, you have also economy. Uh, the Erdogan government is very conscious that if they partner with at least a piece of Libya, which is significant, that would be the western part of Libya and Tripoli, they, they will have a huge access to oil and gas and other richnesses in Libya. And from an economic perspective, that would be uh, huge in terms of interest. Actually, as we speak these days, uh, there are talks between Ankara and Tripoli about special contracts, special concessions 
to Turkey in Libya in terms of a permanent military base, permanent you know, uh, airfields to be used by Turkey, and obviously contract with Turkish companies in Libya. So it is even moving from the secret economic interest to becoming an open economic interest. With regard to Russia, I think that President Erdogan is very skillful in, 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 in politics and policies. He was able to create a kind of an equation in northern Syria, whereby by backing those militias in the north, the Islamist militias, uh, he was able to negotiate with President Putin of Russia, some sort of uh, Brest-Litovsk kind of uh, agreement. You have your influence with the Assad regime, says Erdogan to uh, Putin, and I have my influence in this part. So it looks more like the 19th century division of Poland or of the Balkans between large powers, which, which promoted Turkey as becoming in some sort of those smaller than Russia, but as equal in terms of negotiation. So I think the same would be happening in Libya with one difference. Turkey has more influence in Western Libya than Russia has any influence in Eastern Libya. That's a major difference. Now, from Washington's perspective, I need to add this point because you, you made it. Turkey and Tripoli and Saraj government, the GNA and Qatar have established a very strong platform of influence through lobbying. I mean, our system, you know it, everybody knows it. If, if you have lobbies, if you sign up with lobbies, then it, they will conduct the actual uh, influence for you. And that is not to say that the other side does not have lobbies. Everybody has lobbies here. But the success of the Qatar and Turkey contracted lobbies has been to a point where uh, they have been able to influence U.S. not just position, because that is something that the U.S. sovereignty does, but U.S. perception in the media. Uh, Haftar has been now perceived as warlord, as an ally of Putin and Russia, and nothing was said about the 10,000 jihadists. I mean, if we were after 9-11, if we were in the Bush years and or during the Trump years dealing with ISIS and somebody said that 10,000 <laughs> jihadists in Libya, it would have been a full mobilization. Nobody in the media is talking about it which is a, a huge success of PR for uh, Turkey and Qatar. Uh, Dr. Paris, uh, President Sisi has to be extremely worried about the developments that you just went over. Is Egypt in a position to do anything about them? Egypt is very concerned because it's at home. Uh, Egypt has maybe, I don't know, a thousand miles or kilometers of border with Libya. So if the jihadist of the West reaches Benghazi or closer, then they're gonna be on, 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 in Libya's face, in, in Egypt's face, and Egypt will be sandwiched between pressure coming from Libya, from jihadists in Libya, and those operating in the Sinai. Egypt is the most concerned in this, but beyond Egypt, the Saudis are concerned. The UAE, the Gulf is concerned. And beyond them, Israel is concerned because the actual final goal of these jihadists marching east is to hook up with Gaza, with Hamas. So that's why you have this collection of Israel, undeclared partnership between Israel, Egypt, the Gulf, and Greece, not just because of economic matters, but because of security matters. Thank you very much, uh, Waleed. My last question actually was going to be about uh, Israel's interests in this, but you you just folded that in. And I know we're out of time now, so I would thank you very much in your generosity for uh, giving another outstanding Westminster lecture. Thank, thank you so much for inviting me.